and welcome to Mallard at Large tonight. My guest will be Nathalie Loiseau, former Minister of European Affairs of French President Emmanuel Macron. Right now, her TV profile. Nathalie Loiseau was born in 1964 in a residential northwestern suburb of Paris. She graduated from the Paris Institute of Political Science at the age of 19 and then studied Chinese at the National Institute for Oriental Languages and Civilizations. In 1986, she was only 22 years old. She joined the French Foreign Service. She served in diplomatic missions in Indonesia, Senegal, and Morocco. During these years, she sharpened her skills in conflict resolution, including in Senegal and Western Sahara. In 1993, Nathalie was appointed advisor to Foreign Minister Alain Juppé. From 2002 to 2007, she served as the communications director at the Embassy of France in Washington, D.C. In 2003, she had to manage the campaign in the U.S. against France following the French refusal to take part in the war in Iraq. In 2009, she came back to France and served in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, first as the head of human resources and then as chief of staff. In 2012, Nathalie Loiseau was appointed director of the French National School of Administration. She tried to reform the schools, especially to strengthen equal opportunities. We've seen that in ENA and most of the French private institutions of higher learning. There is a very high number of students who are sons of teachers, and it proves that today the educational system is not understandable by everyone. In 2017, she became French Minister for European Affairs and worked with Jean-Yves Ladrian. Two years later, she left the administration and became the top candidate of La République en Marche, Emmanuel Macron's party, on the electoral list in the 2019 European elections. As a lawmaker, she is vice president of the Delegation for Relationships with the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. She is also the coordinator of the Renew Europe Group in the special commission dedicated to the fight against foreign interference. Two issues that are particularly important in the current situation in Ukraine. Nathalie Luazo is Christiane Millard's guest tonight. Tonight, my guest in Mallard at Large is Nathalie Loiseau, former Minister of European Affairs of French President Macron. Thanks for being with us. My first question is the world order issued from 1945 under US dominance is totally obsolete today. How do you perceive which is shaping up with the rise of Sino-Russian alliance and the decline of the Western camp. Bonsoir, Christian Mallard. Well, good evening, Christian Mallard. I would put things a little bit differently. First of all, the world order has never been so orderly. The world has known different wars since 1945. What has changed is the end of the Great Illusion. At the end of the Soviet Union, people thought that the Russian threat had, would disappear. Now we wake up and we realize that uh, after Grozny, Aleppo, Georgia, perhaps we could have waken up with the first uh, attacks uh, against Ukraine and other countries. But what we can see is that the war has gone back to Europe. I don't know if we can speak about the strength of a China-Russian relation. What we can see is Russia that has uh, put itself in a very difficult situation. They have made a mistake, Vladimir Putin. We can see that the Western world has woken up, has united to respond strongly, to stop the war, to support support Ukraine and to consolidate. Et pour se souder bien davantage. Nathalie Loiseau, until where will Vladimir Putin go? Will he have reached his goal through the annexation of Ukraine or will he go further? Will he challenge NATO countries like Poland and the three Baltic republics? 
Well, I don't know what uh, Vladimir Putin really thinks. It would be pretentious to uh, say how far he can get. And he also makes announcements, and very often, immediately after he does the opposite of what he had announced. Whatever the case, we have heard threatening sentences or declarations regarding the Baltic states, on Finland, uh, Sweden, all of it, of his environment, his surroundings. He speaks about rebuilding the Soviet Union, and he wants to do that with brute force. That is the reason why it is essential for Europe and NATO to have awakened, to show firmness. Biden said so, not uh, one centimeter, centimeter in NATO for Russia. And the attack of Ukraine is really the attack of our democratic model. That is uh, what Putin uh, says about Ukraine. He is angry because Ukraine is turning to the west instead of to the north because Russia is no longer an attractive uh, model for anyone, really. According to you, is there a risk of a third world war? What is uh, sure is that Vladimir Putin is trying to frighten, to intimidate. We can see that in Ukraine, what we can see in Mariupol today. It has no sense in terms of strategy. It's more psychological with thousands of uh, fatal victims. I was in uh, Mariupol six weeks ago when I see the images today. I really, really feel upset. The objective is to spread fear. That is why he speaks about a nuclear threat. That is why he remains in a great ambiguity. Europe, the states, do not want war. We want to put an end to war because there will be no winners. The Russian army is not winning. Nobody can win in this war. We have to do everything we can to stop it, and that's what we're doing. Nathalie Loiseau, Vladimir Putin is obsessed with his mad dream of rebuilding the former Soviet empire. What can stop him? Well, the first thing that could stop it, or, or, or rather frustrate his, intren his intentions, is that the ex-Soviet republics do not wish to go back to the old world. If you have a look at Ukraine, the politicians uh, have an age average of 40. These are people who do, are not nostalgic of the Soviet world. In Moscow, it's 65 years old. Uh, that uh, is completely different. So what we're doing is to put pressure on the so on the Russian regime by all means except sending soldiers with unprecedented sanctions. We do not do so happily. We do it because we want Putin to understand as soon as possible that he has everything to lose and nothing to win if he continues with the war. According to you, which concession Volodymyr Zelensky could make to Vladimir Putin without losing face and which could be acceptable to Vladimir Putin. Volodymyr Zelensky, Volodymyr Zelensky is being immensely courageous. Uh, the people of Ukraine are courageous. The nation of Ukraine has consolidated since the beginning of the Russian invasion, which is exactly the opposite of what uh, Vladimir Putin thought would happen. But uh, Zelensky is also uh, participating in negotiations. For example, he has said that he would not join NATO, that uh, didn't uh, stop Putin from continuing with his invasion. What can stop him? Military difficulties. That is why we should provide more military material to Ukraine to allow them to protect its population, who are really martyred. That is the reason why we have to be very firm. There should be nowhere any holes in the sanctions web. We can understand that Israel does not want to adopt sanctions on Russia for reasons that I can understand, but I also hear people in Israel saying that it is not possible for oligarchs to 
elude Western sanctions using Israel, and I do appreciate that position. So resolution vis-à-vis -vis, uh, Russia, support of Ukraine, and keeping the negotiation channel open, that is why what uh, Emmanuel Macron is doing, who is continuing to speak with Putin, perhaps one of the very few to tell him really what is happening in Ukraine. I'm not sure that uh, many men around Putin have the courage to say the truth or can really say the truth. Vladimir Poutine et ce courage ou soit même en situation de lui dire la vérité. Vladimir Poutine was expecting a blitzkrieg from his army which showed its limits and weaknesses to reach his goals. Could he use according to you chemical arms? Well, it is definitely possible because there is a past which is also a liability in Russia. If you speak about Russia, Mr. Malar, you're right. Bashar al-Assad used chemical weapons in Syria. He did so with uh, an active Russian support. And uh, we can also uh, remember the two ex-KGB agents who were killed in the UK. We can remember Alexei Navalny. We could ask ourselves uh, what happened with uh, the Ukrainian negotiations and Roman Abramovich. Perhaps uh, they uh, were attacked by the Russians. There is a risk that uh, Russia is searching for a provocation in order to use chemical weapons. Apparently, white phosphorus uh, weapons are use, used already against civilians, which is against uh, international human rights. Can we trust? President Zelensky blindly when we know he does try to have the Western camp involved in an open conflict with Vladimir Putin. Volodymyr Zelensky has revealed himself as a great head of state. You remember what we heard when at the time of the elections that he was completely unknown. He started to reform his country and when I was in Ukraine I heard a lot of people that uh, told me oh, finally when we can see projects we can see that the uh, security forces are changing their behavior. Nowadays he has he's showing a personal courage which is keeping up with his people's courage. He is very well supported by his citizens. His appeals are appeals for help. Those who criticize him criticize actually what we consider our bad conscience. Have we done enough before the uh, beginning of the war? I would like to uh, congratulate Biden because he, he, he told us to watch it. He said that Russian, uh, Russian or Vladimir Putin was going to go into Ukraine. But if he was so convinced, why did he not provide more weapons to Ukraine? Why did he not uh, create a no-fly zone earlier that would have perhaps avoided this tragedy. Today it is too late. He said so himself. We do not want to join the war uh, against Russia. We want to stop the war. NATO just decided to strengthen its European eastern flank, close to the frontiers with Ukraine. Don't you think Vladimir Putin might consider it as a new Western provocation? NATO is reinforcing its eastern flank, and that's a good thing. Let's remember that a few months ago, the uh, U.S. spoke only about China or the China-Pacific uh, area uh, that started with Barack Obama. and. Uh, now, it is not happily that Biden has returned to Europe, but the security of Europe, the merit of NATO the, as a defense alliance to defend its members, it is important to defend those who are threatened. France has sent troops to Romania. It is flying over Poland. It is reinforcing its presence in the Baltic states. Other countries are doing similar things. Europe has to defend Europe. We have to defend our security, our society model, and also our freedom. We have a dictator in front of us who does not, who cannot allow, uh, does not accept the failure of his model. That is probably why the Russian army has so many difficulties. He cannot stand to have a free world, an expression that we didn't use for many years, uh, a Europe which is defended itself and is right to do so. Which is the future of NATO with a Joe Biden 
who is scared of war to the point of not fixing a red line to Vladimir Putin. Well, you are right. The signal that has probably helped authoritarian regimes was the withdrawal of uh, uh, the U.S. from Afghanistan that was decided by Trump, let's not forget it, and implemented by Joe Biden. We know that the public opinion in the, U in the U.S. does not want boots on the ground. It does not want body bags coming into the United States. But not fixing red lights is not always a bad idea because in terms of deterrence, you have to remain ambiguous. It is important for the other side not to know what could trigger a stronger response. And it is also a reason for Europe to take into its hands its own security and defense. I am the president of the Committee of Defense in the European Parliament. We are awakening. We are realizing that time is essential. The U.S. is important, but we cannot depend on others in terms of security always. Nathalie Loiseau, tell me. Must Vladimir Putin be considered as a war criminal and a butcher, as Joe Biden dared to say? Today, we can see in Ukraine the general attorney of Ukraine is documenting war crimes that are being committed in Ukraine. Well, that is something that we cannot contest. Justice will have to intervene. We know everywhere in the world there is no real peace without justice. So justice will have to work on that. We can see a maternity uh, hospital, schools, general hospitals, 400 schools, 100 hospitals, and these are the figures a few days ago, have been targeted by the Russians. We are in the middle of crime, uh, of war crimes, and this is a tragic reality. Don't you think the U.S. made a strategic mistake when they made Ukraine believe in 2008, they could join NATO. Well, I'm going to say something that perhaps will surprise you, Mr. Malar. I think that the, the, mis the strategic mistake is a mistake that we all did at the time. We opened the door, but did not allow Ukraine to integrate NATO. In 2014, with the uh, Loro Maidan revolution, when the Ukrainian population has said very clearly that it was turning towards Europe, if Europe nowadays was uh, integrated in NATO, um, pretty sure that Putin would not have attacked. Nathalie Loiseau, I noticed that no clear answer has been given by NATO concerning its possible reaction should Russia use chemical arms. Well, that's what I was saying before. I, am, I strongly believe that when you want deterrence to work, you do not tell the other side, you can go to this line and then you have green light up until there and then we will act. We have the sad memory of Barack Obama's uh, red line with chemical weapons in Syria in 2013 at the end of the day. He did nothing. He gave a signal in the sense that the U.S. stated limits that did not, uh, that were not respected by themselves. What's clear is that will be stronger and stronger responses if there is an escalation or if this war continues in Ukraine. We can hear voices in Moscow speaking about concentrating in the eastern part of Ukraine, who are speaking about reducing radically the military offensive, first of all, because the uh, Russian army is really in a stalemate, and also because of the resolution of the Europeans is giving its results. What we can see at the moment is that there are no winners in Ukraine. The Ukraine army is resisting with the great Courage, but uh, it is facing uh, an army which is much more powerful. The Russian army is, has also difficulties. The Russian economy is uh, in shags. Vladimir Putin is alone because this is a war that is not justified. There was no threat. There was no aggression. So it is weakening uh, Russia.
Is the U.S. administration, according to you, fit to face the situation? They know how to bark, and then it does not go further. We could see it in August 2013, when Barack Obama, which vice president was Joe Biden, refused to interview militarily against Bashar al-Assad, which used chemical arms against its own people, its own opposition. Well, I would say that we have to stop blaming the U.S. because of what they do or they do not do. We should be able to take responsibility uh, of our security and that of our neighbors without asking constantly uh, the U.S. to do it in our place. We have to become adults in Europe. This is what I call the Europe of my wishes. It's too easy to say the Americans should not have gone to Iraq. I said so. You have re reminded us of that uh, uh, a few minutes ago. It's easy to say they should do more here or more there. They define their own essential interests. The Russian uh, threaten threat is multidimensional. It is very visible in Ukraine, but not only there are all those frozen conflicts, conflicts which were just forgotten in Karabakh, Georgia, Transnistria, Donbar. We can see that in Syria. Some people thought that after all, the Russian presence was uh, good because it allowed uh, for certain things. But what did it provide? A situation which is not closed, refugees everywhere in Europe, and Islamist terrorism that is uh, uh, re being reborn constantly. I'm thinking about the families of those two youngsters in Israel that were assassinated by Islamist terrorists a few days ago. One of them was a Franco-Israeli citizen. I'm thinking especially about her family. Let us take our destiny in our hands with our allies. Allies, allies are important. We are not going to turn our back to them, but let's not ask someone else to do our own job. Nathalie Loiseau, tell me, is French President Emmanuel Macron right to keep talking with Vladimir Putin when we know the Russian president doesn't listen at all? to his interlocutors. Well, I think there have been something like 18 phone conversations, perhaps more by now. Emmanuel Macron is right to continue to speak with Putin because there has to be someone to tell him the truth to begin with regarding the stalemate of the, his army in Ukraine. And I'm not sure that his people are telling him. And also, he's not doing so just to give himself more importance or to uh, become more important. He is doing it together with our allies, the, the Americans, the Brits. You know how difficult relationships have been with the UK, together with NATO. And he is trying to find a way to de-escalate, to create a humanitarian corridor. He is even speaking with the Turkish president. You know, relations with Macron have not always been uh, very simple. What he is trying to do is to try to stop the war because this war is a war of losers. It is weakening us all and it is our duty from a humanitarian point of view. You do not need to be successful to persevere. Uh, I think Macron is doing the right thing. Our talk show, Malard at Large, comes to an end now. Many thanks for being our guest, Nathalie Loiseau. See you soon on I-24 News. And I want to thank our team of production, Melanie Zaitoun and Julien Renault and Maël. And we will see you very soon on I-24 News, Malard at Large.